pretty interesting picture. You know, we have no clue what's going to happen this year, next year. We had no idea like the coronavirus was going to come through, but we knew that it was mid-cycle slowdown time and we've been talking about that on camera since 17 and 18, calling 2020 as a year to look out for financially. You know, I asked Phil the other night, what do you do at this stage? since we've actually done a video on some of the questions that we've been getting online and this year we've been getting some amazing questions and in today's video I'm going to interview Ben uh, he doesn't even know what the questions are at this point in time ooh, ooh, ooh. so coming off the cusp here a little bit but <laughs> just going to talk to some of the questions that uh, you guys have been asking recently so we'll start with some of the ones from YouTube uh, this one's first from Jolly Millie. Not too sure if that's your actual name, but I love it. Um, <laughs> but can you please confirm we are now out of the mid-cycle slowdown? Awesome question. One that I've been asking myself for a <laughs> while now. Um, so I actually caught up with Phil Anderson and Akil um, from, you know, it's just Phil Anderson. Everyone knows the guy. Yeah. And effectively, he was saying last Wednesday night when I asked this exact question, um, that we are out of now out of the mid cycle slowdown and we are into the second half of the you know long term real estate cycle which is super crazy and then I obviously asked as a fan of his is um, well what happens next and he says easier money lots of infrastructure like an infrastructure boom sharp asset price rises in the right markets like the right stocks around the world the right properties around the world um, which will lead us up into you know, what he calls the winner's curse phase. And then, you know, longer term, we'll have another GFC type event. So crazy, like that confidence from him, from the man that wrote the book, The Secret Life of Real yeah. Estate and Banking. Massive for me, confidence-wise. Probably why I've been sleeping so good in the last week and a half. <laughs> oh, seriously. Well, after that, after that meeting that you guys had, I was just so excited, hey, and, you know, almost changing my strategy again. But <laughs> <laughs> it is what it is. That's, that's property investing for you, right? Yeah. The next one's from Adam A. Would love to know what you guys think on building duplexes as opposed to granny flats. Mm. Another good question. Thank you, Adam. Great question. Um, the reason I personally build granny flats versus duplexes is price. Um, so I can buy an existing home in the right parts of Australia and then in the right council area, I can build the granny flat. And let's say it spend 350 grand on the house and 150K on the granny flat. My total spend to get about 700 bucks a week in rent return is realistically only um, 500K where if I wanted to go and do the same thing in the same suburb with a duplex, I might have to buy the site for 450K because it's selling for a premium. And then I'm going to have to knock it down and build two brand new houses, which could cost me another 450K. And so to get a very, very similar rent return, I'm spending at least 30 to 40% more. And for me, that's just not part of my strategy because what I'm trying to do is pay off the debt, have a small passive income stream for myself and family for life, which means I don't want to be invested in really, really heavy assets, expensive ones that are giving me really, really low rent returns. Yeah, thanks thanks for that, Benny. I think, you know, it is more of a strategy thing for us. It's not that we've got anything against duplexes and they've been awesome for a lot of people, but for us, we're more low risk investors. We don't really like the debt and it takes a long time and a lot of money to execute a successful duplex deal. The reason people do duplexes is because sometimes they can make some money on the way in and, and capital growth is a big part of what's important to both of us. But I, you know, I don't, I'm not just buying to hope that one day my property is worth more. I want like income in the bank coming in every single day yeah. and week for the rest of my life. So for me, there's so many different ways to do property. Like you can buy just for capital growth. You can buy just for cash flow. You can do what we do, which is both. You can duplex, develop, townhouse, renovate, flip. You've just got to pick your own adventure. <laughs> That's so much, bro. Like yeah. it just becomes so overwhelming when you're trying to do it all, right? You just got to pick your lane and that's what we've done. All I do is as a business and personally, really good single income homes in the right places that are well-timed, you know, Sydney, Melbourne, Brisbane, hold them for five to seven years and sell them for a profit. Or I have the houses with the granny flats that are in good condition that give me a passive income for life. And outside of that, 
I've just got full blinkers on now because I've tried all these other things and they're just not for me. There you go. Uh, so thanks for that, Adam. Now the next one on YouTube from DD Green. Do you guys think DD of Green? DD. Do you guys think of investing in stocks rather than property? It's very convenient timing that this question comes up as well because just off camera before we started filming this <laughs> one, we were just talking about investing in stocks. I was talking to one of my mates actually over the weekend and my account and I've been getting more and more interested in stocks um, just because for a whole number of reasons, mainly just because it seems fun to learn a new skill over the next 10 years. Yeah. Um, you know, we are talking about the strategy. If a couple of friends of ours have done really well out of crypto and Simon was like, well, I'm not really a crypto guy because, you know, I'm not going to be a day trader. Yeah, it and doesn't align I don't buy with currency. And, you know, it's like it was kind of interesting to hear that because when we move into stocks, my and Simon's strategy will probably be the same, like strong capital gains, strong potential for cash flow, long-term value investing the Warren Buffett way. And it's like, you know, we don't currently do that stuff much, but we've just rolled our super over following the barefoot stuff. Um, we might start dabbling in them later in the year. Like I'm really starting to look at the right structure with my account and for me personally, um, the right platform to buy them through. And I've been talking to friends. Now, some of these friends have, you know, millions of dollars of stocks or even more than that, and they just buy for long-term growth. Yeah. Uh, another one of my friends is like, man, I just invest in stocks with a six to nine percent dividend, which I either live off or reinvest in more stocks, depending on if I want to work that year or not. And I'm like, that sounds like a pretty nice place to be, man. Yeah, hell yeah. So definitely we're thinking of getting into it. I guess for us, you know, the reason that we've got to this this position that we're in right now is because we've read lots of books from people that have done it before we've stayed laser focused on achieving our goals um, we get a lot of comfort from understanding something through in like all in all understanding everything and that's what we've done with property we've learned everything that we can we've set up our portfolios in the way that we're going to be able to achieve our longer term goals and now we're slowly but surely starting to look at diversifying into stocks so you know i, I love it i think i'm going to have a passion for it in the future as well uh, but the intention for me was always to set up my property portfolio first, learn 100% of property investing first, and then look at, you know, adding a few more things onto the plate. <laughs> it's, taken me, it's taken me 11 years to figure out property <laughs> for me. And there's so much I yeah. don't know. Oh, like, yeah. So much I don't know. Like, I've got friends that do really complex development stuff. And I'm like, that is just a whole beast in itself. For it's me, not a ball game. I know that it's going to take at least five years if I was reading about stocks every day to figure exactly. out anything meaningful about it. And so rather than rushing in and burning all my money like I did on property <laughs> and making mistakes, I'm just going to slowly read the books from the people that I like. I'm going to slowly talk to the friends that aren't just dabbling and starting but are fully financially free from yeah. it. And then once I've collected information over a year or two, then I'll start you know, playing around with it a bit more, I think. Maybe not, maybe... I'll just continue to do what we love, which is property. I, actually, I know that's what I'm going to continue to yeah, do. Yeah, for like, sure. I've got no intention to help anyone else with stocks, but I just like might spend diversification. You know, sounds a couple nice. of hours a month into stocks as yeah. a second business would be cool. If you got any tips, DD, send them through via email. I'd love to check it out. Um, the next one's from Salty Sands. Cool, like that. Wouldn't it be smarter to invest in your own in your own owner occupier first? to take advantage of government grants, et cetera, and then live there for six months and then rent it out and move into a rental. I absolutely love this question. And I have this, I get asked this question at least once a week. Um, take it away. I don't know how to answer it because like we're not financial advisors or accountants or mortgage brokers. So I suppose you've probably got to figure that out for yourself with those people. Um, for me, when I first got started, I definitely bought my first property, taking advantage of all of those government grants. And I did live in it for that six months or 12 months or whatever I had to at that time back in 2011. Um, but, you know, those grants are huge. Like one of my best mates in Sydney is a solicitor. He's just bought his first unit using the government's 5% deposit scheme at the moment plus free stamp duty. Like he's basically bought a place with 25 grand cash in, I think, Heathcote, south of Sydney, which is insane. Mm. Um I did the same thing. Like I put down a 5% deposit free stamp duty back in the day. It's just making sure I think that you recognize that's not your forever home 
And so make it a good investment as well. Like if your intention is to rent it out in a year's time or whatever the government says you legally need to, then make sure it's a good home on a big block, in a great suburb, in a good city, and you're following the other fundamentals we talk about, not just a place where you can get a bit of money up front and then not make money on it for the next 15 years. Yeah, I'm completely impartial on this one as well. Um, you know, it's all personal circumstance, no doubt about it. Um, but definitely look at the opportunity cost of, you know, making that decision versus investing. Because if the long term plan is to invest, then you've got to have your investment cap on. You've got to be thinking about, OK, well, how is this particular investment linking me or getting me closer to where I want to be in the future? And, you know, sometimes, you know, there might be opportunities or it might not be the right market to, to be taking advantage of those grants and maybe the grants that you get aren't going to put you in a better longer term position as well. So, you know, just run your numbers and, and don't get too focused on the short term gifts and, and maybe start thinking a little bit more about the long term position as well. You know, for me personally, I was and I'm always going to be an investor first. Like I've literally just just bought a home that I want to live in medium to long term with my family. You know, I delayed that for a long, 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 long time. And um you know, like Simon and I both started the same way, like a couple of good investments, then an affordable home. And then, you know, down the line, you leverage off that affordable home and you buy, you know, a slightly nicer one if that's what you want to do, or maybe that's not the game you're trying to play. But I think investing to get financially free, to get choices in your life sooner is what every single person in the world that's lucky enough to have money in the bank and savings and a job and to be in a beautiful, like blessed country like Oz. It's like take advantage of that while you're young enough too because we're working with people that are honestly at the moment 65 years of age and they're just trying to get off the pension versus like working with people Simon's age and my age that are like, I might never have to work again at 40. And it's like that's a whole different way to spend the next 25 years contributing time with kids, dropping them to school, being there in the afternoons, doing the homework with them. Like these are boring ass things to some people, but for me, it's like the Everything. meaning of life. Yeah. It's like doing meaningful work, not having to like be stressed out all the time, volunteering, traveling, taking off for a year, whatever it is for you, retraining, financial freedom is going to enable you to do that sooner. You know, Sometimes your body's just not quite there when you're on the pension or it's too late or you might not be able to live the life that you wanted to live and you certainly don't want to look back with regret. For sure. Uh, but thanks for the question, Salty Sands. Um, now, <laughs> I like it. I love that. It That's reminds me of my, my favourite. Like, uh, when I went over to Sri Lanka, I met these guys. They run this business called Salty Swamis. Ah, uh, uh, that's where it's coming from. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I just love it. And there's this company, there's this business around the coast. I'm not too sure what they do, but we have got the best sticker and it's Salty Souls. And I'm like, salty oh, sounds. sick. Salty Sands, awesome. I was just thinking Love the about... alliteration. Sounds good. Rolls off the tongue well. <laughs> One of Crystal, who's my sister and part of the business here, um, friend is Salty Lux as well. Yeah, Salty Lux. And she's just an Instagram influencer that travels the world and just takes and incredible photos oh, and videos man. in the best places. It's like I get the most photos from Salty. Good. salty. Yeah. <laughs> uh, moving over to some of the questions we've received through uh, Instagram recently. The first one from Samuel... Faircloth, is it possible to get into the investment property market with a $20,000 deposit? Do lenders look at rental return slash instant equity when approving finance? <laughs> I uh, wish they did. Uh, yeah. Because I would not be putting much deposits down on most of the places I've bought. <laughs> they, I, I think they used to back in, back in the day in the 80s or something. But yeah, times have changed and it can be a little bit more difficult to secure finance. That is more of a question for a finance broker, a mortgage broker or a bank manager. Um, you know, because we, we don't have those licenses, we can't really talk too much about it. Let's go talk to them. Um, there are some really good grants in some of the different parts of Australia, some building booths, some stamp duty concessions, some deposit um, concessions, some superannuation stuff. So go talk to your broker about what they are. And, you know, effectively, the question is simple. I've got 20 grand, you know, what could I borrow with that? Or what grants are available to help me borrow a little bit more and get into the market? And then just see if, you know, there's a meaningful suburb in a meaningful market that you can afford with whatever they say you can do. Like 25 grand was what my mate in Sydney just used to get yeah. the unit. Um, I think it's a 500K unit. There you go. Um, with the 5% deposit plus like the stamp duty stuff. 
it seemed to be okay for him, but that doesn't mean it's, you know. Okay for everyone. For me, it was like 35 for my first ever property, which was pretty damn good as well. So how much did you spend on that property again? Uh, that was a $380,000 purchase. Man, I so wish it was. Could get them still. Oh, I'm pro. <laughs> me too. Me too. But, you know, it is what it is. And, you know, that was just under, that was, you know, obviously just under a 10, 10% deposit once you factor in um, all the closing costs associated with it. So, uh, yeah, talk to your broker about that one, Sam. Uh, the next one from Nutty Like Nutella, <laughs> Nazarene, awesome name. Would you guys consider the Sunshine Coast a good target area for potential investors and which particular suburbs? Cool. I love the sunny coast. Like, this is where we're filming from it. today. Yeah, I think, um, what's McGrath's first name? Scott McGrath? Yeah, Scott. Is it Scott? Not, not that we work oh. with, the guy that's McGrath. Real estate. Oh, John McGrath. John McGrath. Yeah, John. I think John McGrath came out with an article a couple of years ago, like so bullish on the Sunshine Coast as well. Um, and honestly, since he has, it's gone up it's, 40%. Like yeah. he was spot on the money. He was straight onto it. But well, yes, I, I absolutely love the Sunshine Coast and I'm so um, fortunate and, and grateful to be already owning a property in the market up here. What you need to know about the Sunny Coast is the coming infrastructure is unprecedented in any regional market in Australia. Like Simon and I did a blog on it a few years back and we've done videos on it that you can go back and check out on our YouTube as well. Um, but you're looking at a light rail project like the Gold Coast or Melbourne, a heavy rail project, a brand new airport runway, brand new hospital, increase in the size of the university, something like the new Maroochydore or CBD the opening. CBD. Uh, I think they said 50,000 new homes over the next 20 years being built in different developments like oh, Aura, it, Harmony, Bly Bly. Yeah, like, maybe that was 10 years. You know, the population between those three estates, they're like billion dollar projects. You've got a new Westfield going out in Aura. Um, those guys don't spend their money unless they think they can make it. That's the first Westfield on the sunny coast. You've just got you know, what happened to me, right, is why I became a bigger fan of the Sunny Coast last year is in COVID, I think I went to northern New South Wales for holidays like mm. six times, um, just little surf trips to get away with the family. And I looked at Kingscliff, Cash Arena, Byron. I looked at um, the Gold Coast, Burley, Cooley. Um, and I just went, holy fuck, the Sunny Coast is legitimately so a million value. dollars cheaper yeah. on the beach. And half a million dollars cheaper back from the beach. And I just went, you know, that was the time when I went, cool, I'm going to grab something else. Mm. And I did. I bought another two properties up here during that time. I just, I like it. Yeah. I, I think it's had a hell of a run though. Like some properties have gone up 100% in five years. Yeah. You've got to be careful of that, eh? We, um, yeah, our, our mum recently sold a property for, for close to 100% um, profit on that one over a four-year period. Uh, I've got about a... a, a almost a 20% increase on the investment property that I purchased in, in, year, man. in less than a year. Uh, so it's hot up here right now. So, you know, there, there is potential for, for a bit further, a bit more growth up here. Uh, things are really looking good, but, you know, just understand that you're probably going to be spending about 100K over what your anticipated budget would be up here at the moment. It's just so hot. You know, so I think the beachside suburbs across the, there's a big road that runs all the way up. I think this is what the... Um, Nicklin. Nicklin Way, effectively. Gosh, you haven't lived away for that long. No, I was, I was thinking <laughs> when, it, when it goes across Maroochydore, what does it become? Sunshine the way the Motorway. The sunny motorway. <laughs> Are <you serious>? <laughs> <laughs> I don't drive across that bridge, man. There's <laughs> too many people. So, up. yeah, you've got the Sunshine Motorway and the Nicklin Way, which is kind of, you know, our our understanding of where you should be buying. We always like to be buying east of those two roads as an investment um, just because are, you're closer to the They have gone beach. nuts. And so what I'm sort of saying is like maybe for a lot of people they've missed that run. Yeah. But like the non-beach side of that, suburbs like Budrum, Budrum Mountain, Mountain Creek, Creek Karamundi, um, Karamundi, Golden Beach, um, Warana, Aruna, Little Mountain. You know, there's some really, really good quality buying there. Um, once you get north of Maroochydore, I'm sure there's some good buying up there as well. We just don't 
know it as much because it's too far from Brisbane for me. But I really like up that way. Uh, Yarumba, uh, Coolum area is great. Um, Yandina Creek is amazing. Our sisters just bought in that area as well. Um, lots and lots of potential up there and you know then the further north that you get it's it gets pretty crazy up there closer to Noosa and then there's some suburbs like inland like Mons, Forest Glen and Tanawa which are literally 50 cents in the dollar compared to yeah. northern New South Wales right now for acreage blocks so there's a lot of potential around the coast like I think the um, population is expected to grow 40 percent in the next 10 years grew by what 20,000 people in the last year through COVID vacancy rates are the lowest in the country like there are people legitimately sleeping in their cars it's so unfortunate Rent, rents have gone up by 150 to 200 bucks a week in the last four 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 months it's gone nuts people are literally kicking tenants out of their houses to get an extra 100 bucks a week in rent it's it's pretty pretty hectic up here at the moment uh hopefully that tapers off a little bit or I we see an increase in supply because there's no more supply coming on but you know fingers crossed it's just one of those spots it's a beautiful place to live with a good lifestyle and i think there's good money to be made here in the next five years so the next one's from uh emma emma, emma lou i was wondering i was wondering to know if you work with people living in other states we are in WA and really like what you do and think we would be interested in jumping into investing but can't find companies like yours that help stay to finish here in WA. So I think the question is, do we help people buy properties in the states that they live in? Uh, no, as a business, we're focused 100% in Southeast Queensland right now. Um, you know, we prefer to kind of try to become the experts in one market rather than try and keep an eye on everything that's happening around Australia mm -hmm. because there's lots of value around Australia at the moment but you know based on the research and the study that we've done we really like the look of southeast Queensland you know we love the look of southeast Queensland but I love the look of Perth too um, yeah my suggestion for you would be to just follow the simple rules of within you know 10 to 15 k's of the city if you can or within a couple of k's to the beach um, you know, there are good buyers agents over there. I don't know any of them um, personally at all, but I'm sure you could like Google and YouTube and hopefully find a partner that values aligns with you over there. Yeah, just organise a few conversations with these buyers agents and ask them the right questions like, are you a property investor yourself and what type of properties do you hold? Um, why are you recommending this particular asset? How does this link to my longer term goals and how are you getting paid? Mm. Um, if you get the right answers to all of those questions, then you're going to be able to figure out where their, um, I guess, their values are coming from and where their recommendations are coming from as well. For sure. Um, the next one was from Josho, one of the boys. Thanks, mate. Um, how come I can't find any availability for a strategy session on your website? Um, so the way our website works is we use an online booking platform. We offer generally between seven and 15 sessions a week, but we can legitimately have like a lot of people reaching out. And so what happens is the calendar opens up, all of the sessions are available online, people book them and then they close again. Um, so yeah, it's just, it's just one of those things, like as a business, we've always been super lucky to get a lot of people reaching out. Um, we can only offer a limited number of those and because we only take on a small number of people each month as well, we're not just doing hundreds of sessions a week, you know what I mean? Yeah, um, so yeah, sorry if you've been trying to book in and, and haven't had a chance to. Hopefully you find a time slot that opens up soon that, that works for you and, and we can have a chat to talk about where you're at right now, where you're looking to be in the future, what your property investment goals are and, and you know what type of opportunities may be out there to help you get closer to those longer term goals. Um, if you're super interested and you've been looking for a bit but you can't find a time, like you can hit us up at info at pumpedonproperty.com um, and Simon or myself will give you a quick call and just check in. But you know, these sessions, because they're so small, are really for people that are thinking of doing something in the next three to six months. And then the last question on Insta was from Rory Griffin. Um, legend, good to have you back on board, mate. 
Uh, 43 for Rory, good stuff, man. He's been on fire recently. I had a mad chat with him the other day because I'm just learning how to play guitar at the moment. And I don't know if you've seen Rory, but he is a full axe man. Is he? Oh, he's so good. Sick. And uh, I called him, I'm like, oh, we'll have to have a jam session one day. <laughs> and, like, I'll just be playing my two chords and he'll just be ripping Led Zeppelin stuff. <laughs> is there anything Rory can't do? He's just a beast. Uh, what are your personal predictions for the property market in 2021? Big um, question. We don't have personal predictions, but I follow Phil Anderson, Fred Harrison, Ray Dalio, Warren Buffett. I also follow CBA, a SQM, Heron Todd White, Core Logic. And so those guys expect the Australian property market to do incredibly well in the next um, six months. Actually, I think February was the strongest month on in the last 19 years in Australia of capital growth in one month. Um, most most of the capital cities they're expecting CBA to do what seven to nine percent this year at Correct. least. Yep. Um, I think most of the capital cities did over three percent growth in the last quarter in the last twelve weeks, which is insane. It doesn't sound like much until you go well in three months on a five hundred k property, people made fifteen grand. Like that's fifteen grand without going to work. It's big money. Um, where super excited like simon's looking to buy another property this year i i'll probably buy one more property this year as well um fortunate position to be in yeah like we're both lucky enough to be buyers at the bottom of the market i think perth brisbane um maybe adelaide look really good for the next five years i think sydney and melbourne unless they let all of the international investors back in um and they open up the borders for in, immigration it, it's going to be hard for them to go up by much more, in my perspective, than 20% in the next few years. Mm -hmm. I just feel like there's a ceiling that Australians cannot, can no longer afford to pay to live there, but internationals can. It's so cheap compared to Singapore or London or Hong Kong or Beijing or um, New York. So it's like if they let all that money in, like a billion wealthy people around the world speculate, Sydney and Melbourne could go through the roof. But if they don't, you know, that's why we're in places like, Brizzy and, and Perth more as well. I guess another question that I'd like to throw in there is, you know, based on that, you know, let's say that the property market does grow by 10% this year, 9, 9, 10%. Is it still a good time to buy in 2022? Sure. Yeah. I mean, I think it's, you know, we're just entering the second half of the long-term real estate cycle. You know, that second half normally lasts about five to six years. Um, Phil Anderson and Fred Harrison are saying 2026 is going to be about the next top before we come into some sort of pretty heavy GFC type environment again. So it's like 2020, 2021, 2022, 2023 for me, and probably 2024 will all be good buying years. Um, but that's because I've got an awareness of it. That's yep. not a good buying year for everyone. Like those years, if you're not in a strong financial position and you're not playing it safe, could be really bad years for, for others. Sure. So it's like talking to your accountant, your financial advisor or your mentors or whoever you have in your life and then making a decision based on your level of knowledge. But for me, I reckon the next three to four years are going to be insane. Like a once in a 20 year opportunity in Brisbane and Perth. To 100%. Just clean up and we want to take advantage of that personally and we're going to help a small number of people do that over the next four years too yeah for sure i was reading an update from Catherine cashmore and she was kind of looking at um this stage of the real estate cycle last time round, which was sort of 2001 through to 2007 for brizzy wasn't it yeah it was for brizzy and and over that period of time it, it increased by 180 percent so 2001 you know, to 2007 it's crazy that was so, the second half of the last cycle just before the gfc now we're not saying that's going to happen again um it's but you know it's when actually, you think about saying the opposite it's not going to happen <laughs> yeah but you know 10 percent in the grand scheme of things isn't isn't too much so so don't be too worried about if you can't get in this year there's there's still plenty of buying opportunities but get get educated you know talk to your mortgage brokers and see what you can do to try and bring things forward as, as soon as you can you know there's industries at the moment after talking to um akil and phil anderson last week online like the Australian Stock Exchange hasn't passed its 2007 peak yeah. yet, which means in 13 or 14 years, we haven't hit another high. Mm. So as soon as it passes and maintains that high, there's so much potential in the Australian Stock Exchange. Like you look at certain industries like 
like according to them, like banking or travel, like food, like there's so much potential out there in technology. And then in real estate, it's like Sydney and Melbourne are bloody expensive and they've gone up by almost 80% in the last 10 years. But Perth, Adelaide, Brisbane are legitimately cheaper to buy according to Core Logic than they were 12 to 14 years ago in some instances, coming off such a low base. And it's like there's all this money, like what we saved $125 billion of extra household savings last year. We've got $35 billion that was pulled out of super. I've got heaps of friends that did that. You've got people paying $300 million. Dad said to me last week, based on the Australian Financial Review, like something like Australians paid an extra $300 million off their home loans. We've got more money in offset than any time in Australian history. Interest rates are low. Construction's about to boom again. Infrastructure's about to boom again. You know, we will get immigrant immigration back. We will get tourism back. Like Which they're talking two to three hundred thousand people per year when they do open up oh, the gates. Easy. I reckon the first two years are going to be four hundred thousand yeah. pop. I just feel like they're going to flood Australia with immigrants yeah. to fill the Sydney and Melbourne unit problem right now. Yeah. So it's it's a good time to be alive, and and it's a good time to be an investor at the moment. We're really excited about the next five to six years and, you know, interest is, interested to see what actually comes about. Mm. Um, but, you know, when you mention all of those different pieces of the puzzle and you start putting them together, it paints a pretty interesting picture. You know, we have no clue what's going to happen this year, next year. We had no idea like the coronavirus is going to come through, but we knew that it was mid-cycle slowdown time and we've been talking about that on camera since 17 and 18, calling 2020 as a year to look out for financially. You know, I asked Phil the other night, what do you do at this stage? And he says for him personally, he's going to buy some good quality assets and he's going to put himself in a stable position to take advantage of the next downturn. And so it's always about, you know, that combination of don't go rushing in like the crazy crypto guys, you know, and buy at the top of a real estate cycle. Don't go rushing in like people did in 2017 in Sydney and Melbourne and then not have any real gains until now. You know, be safe. Like, don't over leverage and overdo it. You know, have some cash in the bank to protect yourself. Have a position that enables you to go comfortably through markets, whether you have a job or you don't have one. Like, Simon and I this morning were just planning out his next four years. And I did the same thing for myself last week. Like, actually think about where you want to be and safely work towards it, but don't build yourself a house mm. of cards on yeah. sand, you know what I mean? And, and then expect for just because things are good now for them to not go bad down Mm. the line because i can fucking guarantee this in the next 10 years it's going to be really hard at some point Mm. and a lot of people will be in a bad bad way financially and the only thing that's got to turn the only thing that's got to turn and i want this on record now is what phil said to me as soon as interest rates start going up in a meaningful way the world is so chronically leveraged in debt that it's going to have a massive ripple effect into foreclosures and bankruptcies and business failures and people getting sacked. I remember at the year that I started with IBM, 2011, 200,000 people at IBM got sacked. I was like, how, the, how did I get through? <laughs> like as a graduate, I was like, I must have been cheap labour. I'm spitting. Um, but You're yeah, rambling. I'm rambling. I'm rambling now. Good. I'm spitting. Nah, it's a good ramble. Thanks Thanks for sharing that and thanks for answering all of those questions. Um, you know, we just want everybody to take advantage of the opportunities that are out there, but also stay safe. You know, it's almost inevitable that what Ben and Phil are talking about is going to happen. So, you know, you can either be on the side that works with it or, you know, gets taken advantage of from the cycle, which, you know, I know what side that I personally want to be on. Um, But, you know, thank you so much to everybody that's engaging with the channel and sending through these questions. We'll continue doing these types of videos, answering all of the questions that come through, um, you know, every now and again. And yeah, please, you know, drop in into the DMs on Insta or flick us a message on Facebook or write a comment onto one of the YouTube videos because, We'd love to hear about what you guys want to hear about, the questions that you want answered at the moment, and, and we'll get onto it and do our very best at answering them. You know, for those um, of you that are really thinking about doing something in the next three to 12 months, um, Simon and I do offer these complimentary strategy sessions over at www.pumpedonproperty.com. Um, all you have to do is click the free strategy session button and 
we can talk about where you are and where you'd like to be and then we can educate you on more about the Australian market and then you can take that and not do anything or do something on your own or maybe you can become one of the small number of people that we'll work with this year and you know we can help you move into the market with confidence from our experience of buying what 200 250 million dollars worth of property now and you can leverage off all the hard lessons that we've learned personally and all of our relationships and all of our off-market properties that we pick up as well and you know become a part of what you really want for your future because property is just the vehicle to get you to where you want to be mm. and the sooner you recognize that that a passive income can give you choices to be who you're supposed to be the sooner you can take that step into that that life that you're supposed to be living and and that's our passion and that's why we keep showing up and doing this stuff love that bro thank you guys so much for listening as always invest safely sweaty so sweaty Oh, that's good.